Section 18 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 9. Robert Peel's Ministry, 1841 to 1846, Part 2. The bare record of the memoirs makes it clear that Peel felt his responsibility at this juncture almost too heavy for endurance. That responsibility was, however, somewhat lightened, and at the same time the hand of his colleagues was forced by the publication, November 22, 1845, of Lord John Russell's Edinburgh letter. At last, Lord John declared unequivocally for the policy of free imports. By this time Peel himself was convinced that the Corn Laws must go, but his colleagues were not equally open to conviction, and it was at least doubtful how far repeal would be popular in Parliament and in the country at large. For years past, Cobden and the League had been vigorously preaching their crusade, but the masses were not yet converted. Cobden himself admitted that so far as the fervor and efficiency of our agitation has gone, it has eminently been a middle-class agitation. Cobden and Villers were more successful with the minister than with the masses. The fissure in the cabinet was, however, too deep for healing, and on December 5, 1845, Peel wrote to the Queen, with a heart full of gratitude and devotion to Your Majesty, but with a strong conviction that in the present state of affairs he can render more service to your majesty and to the country in a private than in a public station the queen therefore asked lord john russell to form a ministry despite peel's promise of support however lord john after nearly a fortnight of fruitless endeavour was obliged to inform the queen december twentieth of his inability to obey her commands and in disraeli's phrase handed back with courtesy the poisoned chalice to Sir Robert. Peel, deeply moved by the Queen's distressing dilemma, agreed at once to carry on the government. I will be your minister, happen what may. I will do without a colleague rather than leave you in this extremity. Lord Stanley alone persisted in his resignation, and his place at the colonial office was taken by Mr. Gladstone. The Queen expressed to King Leopold her extreme admiration of our worthy Peel, who shows himself a man of unbounded loyalty and courage and high-mindedness, and his conduct towards me has been chivalrous almost, I might say. We have indeed, she added, had an escape, for though Lord John's own notions were very good and moderate, he let himself be entirely twisted and twirled about by his violent friends, and all the moderate ones were crushed. No words could more aptly summarize the events of the past fortnight. Peel's conduct was indeed entirely chivalrous and self-forgetful, and he had to pay the penalty. For the moment he was in the highest spirits at having got Mr. Gladstone and kept the Duke of Buckley. Lord Ellenborough was also brought back into the cabinet, January, 1846, as First Lord of the Admiralty. The ministerial changes were few and simple, but Peel had now to face Parliament. On January 22nd, the Queen opened Parliament in person. Her speech was strangely cautious and colourless. She referred to the prevalence of serious crime in Ireland, lamented the imminence of famine, expressed satisfaction at the enactment of measures calculated to extend commerce and to stimulate domestic skill and industry, by the repeal of prohibitory and the relaxation of protective duties, and recommended Parliament to consider whether the principles on which they had acted might not, with advantage, be yet more extensively applied." After the moving and seconding of the address, Peel at once rose to make a statement as to his own position and that of his government. He explained that their resignation in December was due immediately to the failure of the potato crop, 
in that it forced an immediate decision upon the laws which governed the importation of grain. He confessed without shame his conversion to the principle of free trade, a conversion strengthened by the experience of the last three years. During that period he had watched day by day the effect of the relaxation of duties, both on finance and on the social interests of the country, and he felt justified in proceeding with the further removal of protecting duties. But he had not felt it proper that the charge of altering the Corn Laws should devolve upon him as Minister of the Crown. He then reviewed the events of the past autumn, the increasing gravity of the news from Ireland, the dissensions in the Cabinet, Lord John Russell's Edinburgh letter, the opposition of Lord Stanley, the resignation of the Cabinet, Lord John's inability to form a government, his own retention of office and determination to submit his proposals to Parliament. Finally, in a noble peroration, he dissipated the idea that he had any desire after serving four sovereigns to cling to the imaginary suites of office, protested his devotion to his sovereign and his country, and vindicated his loyalty to the principles of true conservatism. To conduct the government of this country is a most arduous duty. It is no easy task to ensure the united action of an ancient monarchy, a proud aristocracy, and a reformed constituency. I have thought it consistent with the conservative policy to promote so much of happiness and contentment among the people that the voice of disaffection should be no longer heard, and that thoughts of the dissolution of our institutions should be forgotten in the midst of physical enjoyment. But I will not stand at the helm during such tempestuous nights as I have seen, if the vessel be not allowed to pursue fairly the course which I think she ought to take, and I do not wish to be the Minister of England, but while I have the high honour of holding that office, I am determined to hold it by no servile tenure. I will only hold that office upon the condition of being unshackled by any other obligations than those of consulting the public interests and of providing for the public safety. Only one voice was raised in protest. It was that of Disraeli, whose hour for long-meditated revenge had come. In an hour of jibes and bitterness, he denounced Peel's speech as a glorious example of egotistical rhetoric, and his policy as a betrayal of the principles which had put him in power, and the party which had kept him there. But the address was carried without a dissentient voice. Five days later the Prime Minister unfolded his scheme and committee. To its general principles, reference has already been made. Cheap raw materials for the manufacturer, but no protection against fair foreign competition. Cheaper seed for the farmer, but no protection against foreign meat or corn. For all, cheaper living. The corn laws were not to be abrogated immediately in their entirety. The duty was to be reduced to one shilling after February 1st, 1849, but in the meantime it was to be ten shillings when corn averaged less than 48 shillings a quarter, diminishing to four shillings when the price was 53 shillings or over. The protectionists organized and led with consummate adroitness by Disraeli and Lord George Bentinck made a brave fight but they numbered less than 250, and on May 15th, Peel carried the third reading of his Corn Bill by a majority of 98, 327 to 229. Thanks to the great authority of the Duke of Wellington, it was steered safely through stormy waters in the House of Lords, being read a third time on June 25th. On the very same night, the Ministry were defeated in the Commons on their Life Preservation Bill for Ireland by a majority of 73. The protectionists could not avert or even delay the repeal of the Corn Laws, but they could still take dramatic, not to say melodramatic, revenge upon the minister 
not for the first time as they believed had peel fouled his own nest betrayed his principles and befooled his followers the majority against the government was a motley one made of tories and whigs protectionists and free traders radicals and repealers the alliance was as infamous as it was short-lived but to the author of it the revenge was infinitely sweet in the most vivid chapter of the most brilliant political biography in the language he has himself described the scene in the house peel sat grim on the treasury bench as the protectionists passed in defile before the minister to the hostile lobby it was impossible that he could have marked them without emotion the flower of that great party which had been so proud to follow one who had been so proud to lead them they had extended to him an unlimited confidence and an admiration without stint they had been not only his followers but his friends they trooped on all the men of metal and large acred squires sir robert looked very grave he began to comprehend his position and that the emperor was without an army footnote disraeli life of george bentinck chapter sixteen end footnote two days later peel announced to the house the resignation of the ministry in an elaborate but not wholly felicitous speech peel's ministerial career was at an end but until his life was suddenly terminated by an accident in eighteen fifty he remained though not in office undeniably in power without his steady support his successors could not have weathered the parliamentary storms i never knew a man in whose truth and justice i had a more lively confidence such a tribute from the duke of wellington his sometimes chief his sometimes follower his lifelong colleague is conclusive the greatest member of parliament that ever lived was the verdict of his most virulent opponent but opponent as he was no one judged him with greater acumen or upon the whole more fairly than disraeli it is true that in debate he denounced him as a burglar of other men's intellect for between forty and fifty years from the days of mr horner to those of the honourable member for stockport cobden the right honourable gentleman has traded on the ideas and intelligence of others his life has been one great appropriation clause there has been no statesman who has committed petty larceny on such a scale this is of course the exaggerated language of debate but even in the calm of literary reflection he denied to him gifts of prescience of imagination of originality he declared that he had a dangerous sympathy with the creations of others that he lacked the gift of true leadership that he was really deficient in self-confidence that he was a bad judge of character and had little knowledge of men but on the other hand he described him as a transcendent administrator of public business and a matchless master of debate in popular assembly in the senate he was the readiest easiest most flexible and adroit of men he played upon the house of commons as upon an old fiddle where disraeli blames he is apt to be captious but his praise is both just and acute we may allow that peel was in Badgett's phrase prone to receive the daily deposits of insensibly changing opinion it constitutes one of his strongest titles to the name of a great parliamentary statesman the complex parliamentary machine involves a division of labour cobden could never have carried the repeal of the corn laws nor o'connell catholic emancipation they sowed the seed but it was peel's strong brain and overmastering will which enabled him to garner the parliamentary harvest in the foregoing pages attention has been concentrated upon the financial and fiscal reforms carried by peel during his great ministry but the years between eighteen forty one and eighteen forty six were not devoid of other interests foreign affairs were throughout the whole period of secondary importance thanks mainly 
to the personal friendship of Peel and Guizot. But it is important to note that the signature of the Treaty of Washington, better known as the Ashburton Treaty, effected in August of 1842, a satisfactory settlement of a long-standing dispute as to the boundary line between Canada and the United States, and that in 1846 the Oregon Treaty similarly settled the boundary on the Pacific coast, giving us undisputed possession of Vancouver Island. In India, matters of great importance were in progress, but to these attention will be directed later. At home, social questions were much to the front. The appalling facts revealed by a commission of inquiry as to the employment of women and children in mines and collieries enabled Lord Ashley to carry, in 1842, a bill which prohibited work underground for women, girls, and boys under ten years of age. The same act laid down regulations for the prevention of accidents and limited the employment of apprentices. The sectarian bitterness of Roman Catholics and nonconformists foiled the efforts of Sir James Graham to secure in 1843 a modicum of education for pauper and factory children, but in 1844 he added one more to the lengthening series of factory acts. Under this act, the legal hours of labor in factories for children between the ages of eight and thirteen were further reduced to six and a half hours. Children were obliged to attend school for three hours a day, and increased powers were conferred upon inspectors. In connection with this measure, Graham incurred some ill-deserved unpopularity which was intensified in the following year by the disclosure of the fact that he had issued a warrant to the officials of the post office authorizing them to open the letters of the Italian patriot Mazzini, then a political exile in England. Lord Aberdeen also shared the odium attached to Graham's conduct in consequence of the fact that the brothers Bandiera, deserters from the Austrian navy and martyrs in the cause of Italian independence, were shot by the Neapolitan government for participation in an insurrectionary movement. The Bandieras had been in correspondence with Mazzini, and when it was discovered that Mazzini's letters had been opened at the post office, it was inferred, not unnaturally, that Lord Aberdeen had communicated information thus obtained to the Austrian or Neapolitan governments. It has now been proved, but only within the last few years, that Aberdeen had no such information and had therefore nothing whatever to do with the fate which overtook the brothers Bandiera. That Mazzini's letters were for a few months opened is true, but in permitting this to be done Graham merely exercised a discretion necessarily vested in the Secretary of State, though not, it is understood, frequently resorted to. Graham was very fiercely assailed both in Parliament and in the press, and felt deeply the imputations made upon his personal honor. To the particular incident, an exaggerated importance was attached. It is now agreed that, however odious the duty thus imposed upon the Secretary of State, it is one with the occasional performance of which it is impossible in the public interest to dispense. Of much greater permanent significance were the movements which at this time agitated both the Church of England and the Church of Scotland. The two movements, though widely divergent in their ultimate results, had in a sense a common origin. Both proceeded from parties in the churches impatient of the somewhat conventional respectability which ecclesiastical establishments are apt to engender, and anxious to emphasize the spiritual character of the Christian society. The movement in the Scotch church was eminently disruptive, and resulted in 1843 in the secession of nearly 400 ministers and the establishment of the Free Church. The immediate points in dispute were on the one hand the respective rights of lay patrons and parishioners in regard to presentation of benefices, on the other the precise relation of the civil and ecclesiastical courts. The secessionists, led by Dr. Thomas Chalmers and Dr. Welsh, 
insisted upon the rights of parishioners as against patrons and upon the superior validity of the decrees of the ecclesiastical courts according to chalmers the indispensable the vital object at stake is the uncontrolled management of our own ecclesiastical affairs the disputes were of long standing but in eighteen forty two an appeal was made to the government and their decision in favour of lay patronage and the authority of the state unquestionably precipitated the secession described above the contemporaneous movement in the english church was certainly not less important so important indeed was it that the details must be sought in special monographs in this place a bare summary must suffice in eighteen thirty three john keble at that time professor of poetry at oxford preached before the university a sermon on national apostasy in the same year john henry newman like keble a fellow of oriel college published the first of a long series of tracts for the times these were the men who joined by richard hurl froude edward bouverie pusey and others lit a fire in oxford which has since burnt brightly throughout the english-speaking world impatience of dogma mistrust of enthusiasm neglect of the pastoral office indifference to historical tradition exaltation of the virtues of sobriety of thought and respectability of demeanour these were the outstanding features of the church of the eighteenth century the church whose apathy converted the wesleyan revival into a schismatic secession these were the principles implicit in the erastianism of the early victorian whigs from these things the tractarians were minded to deliver both the church and the nation keble newman and pusey took up the task of educating their brethren of the anglican church at the point where it had dropped from the fingers of archbishop laud like the arminians of the seventeenth century they desired to vindicate the catholic position of the anglican church to reassert its identity with the pre-reformation church in england to insist on the continuity of its apostolic succession to exalt the episcopal order to revive the ancient and stately ceremonial to emphasize the importance of the sacraments to enhance the authority of a mediatorial priesthood it was almost inevitable that some men having gone thus far in the direction of catholicism should be impelled to go further tract ninety on the thirty-nine articles was a notable advance on tract one and in eighteen forty five the author of both joined the church of rome but though newman and w g ward found the via media too slippery for them keble pusey and thousands more remained entirely loyal to the church of england for a time the secessions to rome brought grave suspicion upon the oxford movement as a whole but the alarm gradually subsided and the personal piety the pastoral devotion and the missionary zeal which was characteristic of the followers of keble and pusey extorted the respect even of opponents and profoundly influenced both the life of the church and the ideals of the nation during the latter half of the nineteenth century the history of the oxford movement is however too specialized for treatment here it is time to get back to the main political stream that stream carries us irresistibly to ireland at no period during peel's ministry were irish affairs very far in the background the general election of eighteen forty one had as we have seen shattered o'connell's party and in the new house of commons barely a dozen repealers found seats nevertheless o'connell proclaimed early in eighteen forty two that this was to be the great repeal year o'connell spared no pains to verify his prediction monster meetings were held in all parts of the country and the repeal rent a voluntary tax imposed for the purpose of sustaining the agitation yielded no less than forty eight thousand pounds a marked feature of the agitation due partly to the influence of o'connell himself and partly to the temperance crusade of father matthew 
was the absence of crime and disorder. Nevertheless, the government passed a bill to regulate the use and sale of arms and prohibited the holding of a monster demonstration at Clontarf. The meeting was called for October 8, 1843. The prohibition was issued only on the evening of the 7th. Thanks to O'Connell's immediate acquiescence in the order and the perfect discipline of his followers, the meeting was abandoned and much bloodshed was thereby avoided. The government, however, showed a curious lack of appreciation of their debt to O'Connell. He and his son John and a half a dozen associates were arrested, and after a trial which lasted for twenty-five days, O'Connell was convicted and ultimately sentenced to pay a fine of two thousand pounds, to be imprisoned for twelve months, and to find sureties that he would keep the peace for some years. The imprisonment lasted only three months, as the House of Lords on appeal reversed the judgment. Their action completed the discomfiture of O'Connell. He came out of jail a broken man. His hold upon his compatriots was fatally loosened. Peel's generous policy in 1845 had largely contributed to his collapse. The visitation of 1846 confirmed it. On February 8, 1847, O'Connell made his last speech in the House of Commons, mainly in dumb show. On May 15th, he died at Genoa on his way to Rome. A great political organizer, a superb mob orator, a devoted son of the Church, it was O'Connell's life work to dethrone the territorial aristocracy and to crown in their place the Irish priesthood. Two years before O'Connell's death, Peel had sent his message of peace to Ireland. Against repeal he was adamant, but short of repeal there was no concession to Irish sentiment, which he was not ready to consider sympathetically. In 1843 he appointed a strong commission under the chairmanship of the Earl of Devon to inquire into the state of the law and practice in respect to the occupation of land in Ireland. In 1845 the Devon Commission issued a report of first-rate importance on the strength of which Stanley introduced a bill recognizing the principle of compensation for unexhausted improvements. It was strenuously opposed, and after reference to a select committee, Stanley withdrew the bill to be amended and at a more convenient season reintroduced. The season did not recur for a generation. With his educational reforms, Peel was more fortunate. He increased the grant for elementary education in 1844, and in the same year, by the Charitable Bequests Act, he made a wise concession to Roman Catholic sentiment. In 1845, he made further provision for Maynooth College, a seminary which had been established in 1795 for the education of Catholic priests. Aided from its inception by the state, the college had, since 1808, received £8,000 a year from the government. Peel now proposed to make a donation of £30,000 for buildings and to increase the annual grant to £26,000. To avoid the necessity for an annual discussion of the grant, he further proposed to charge it upon the consolidated fund. This statesmanlike proposal was assailed with a hurricane of abuse. It blew simultaneously from several quarters, from parsimonious economists willing to vote money to Maynooth, provided the sum was meagre, from logical secularists who disapproved of all ecclesiastical endowments, and from rigid Protestants who did not object to endowments, but only to the endowment of error. Among the assailants of the bill were Lord John Russell, Bright, Macaulay, and Gladstone. But Peel withstood the clamor, and his message of peace was safely dispatched. Unfortunately, it failed of its purpose. The increased endowment of Maynooth produced a marked change, not wholly for the better, in the status of the Irish priesthood. It did not diminish their hostility to England. In 
the same year witnessed the passing of a bill for the establishment of the queen's colleges at belfast cork and galway one hundred thousand pounds were voted for their establishment and provision was made for an endowment of twenty one thousand pounds a year the root principle of the scheme as propounded by sir james graham was the avoidance of all interference positive or negative in all matters affecting the freedom of conscience by anglicans like ingles the proposal was denounced as a gigantic scheme of godless education by roman catholics as a measure dangerous to the faith and morals of the people nevertheless peel and graham cordially supported by the queen persisted in their scheme the colleges were set up and in eighteen fifty were affiliated into the queen's university of ireland but the scheme was only partially successful with undenominational education the irish roman catholics would have nothing to do the belfast college prospered but the roman catholics in eighteen fifty four established in dublin a university of their own which cut the ground from under the godless colleges of galway and cork and despite many well-meant but doctrinaire attempts the question of university education in ireland remained in an unsatisfactory and unsettled condition until nineteen o eight before the close of the year eighteen forty five every other question in ireland had as we have seen to be postponed to the immediate necessity of succouring the people from starvation to this problem peel addressed himself if not with infallible wisdom at least with unimpeachable energy early in december he purchased through the bearings one hundred thousand pounds worth of maize from the united states and retailed it in ireland at one penny a pound he set up relief committees under a central organization in dublin and devised a scheme for the employment of the people on public works the usual results ensued the pay was adequate and the work exceedingly attractive to the less strenuous characters in december eighteen forty six two hundred and seventy six thousand men were thus employed by march of eighteen forty seven the number had risen to seven hundred and thirty four thousand meanwhile the ordinary industries were starved of labour the fisheries writes a contemporary were deserted and it was often difficult to get a coat patched or a pair of shoes mended the experiment had palpably failed other remedies had to be devised but peel's responsibility was by this time over it was left to his successor to solve the problem of the many difficulties bequeathed to lord john russell none was more insistent End of section eighteen section nineteen of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten lord john russell's first administration eighteen forty six to eighteen fifty two the irish famine and its consequences part one the nineteenth century writes mr george peel has witnessed the persistent vengeance of ireland we destroyed her manufactures in the eighteenth century in the nineteenth she has destroyed our ministries it is truly said and of no ministry is it more true than the great administration of sir robert peel his defeat in june of eighteen forty six was due primarily of course to a desire for vengeance on the part of the protectionists but it was the irish coercion bill which gave them the chance of glutting it lord john russell's ministry did not differ widely in personnel from that of lord melbourne he himself became first lord of the treasury lord lansdowne led the house of lords as lord president of the council lord cottenham returned to the woolsack from which in eighteen fifty he retired in favour of lord truro lord palmerston resumed his place at the foreign office lord grey became secretary for war in the colonies 
and Sir George Grey, Home Secretary. Sir Charles Wood was Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Sir J. C. Hobhouse, afterwards Lord Broughton, was President of the Board of Control. Other Cabinet officers were filled by Lord Minto, Privy Seal, Lord Auckland, Admiralty, Lord Clarendon, Board of Trade, Lord Campbell, Duchy of Lancaster, Lord Morpeth, Woods and Forests, Lord Clanricard, Postmaster General, and Mr. T. B. Macaulay, who for a few months was Paymaster of the Forces. The last named and the Lord Chancellor were the only members of the Cabinet who did not succeed to office by the divine right of Whiggism. Eight of the fifteen were hereditary peers, and the rest were, with two exceptions, closely connected with the peerage. But the ministry as a whole was undoubtedly rich, both in talent and experience. Of the many difficulties by which Russell and his colleagues were confronted, the most obtrusive was the condition of Ireland, and it may be well, therefore, to review the Irish policy of the new government before proceeding to other topics. The executive in Ireland was confided to Mr. La Bouchere, who had a seat in the cabinet as chief secretary, and Lord Bessborough, who succeeded Lord Hatesbury as Lord Lieutenant. But much of the attention both of the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary was necessarily given to Irish business. The problem was sufficiently perplexing. The peasants had to be at once succored and coerced. Crime and famine were stalking hand in hand throughout the country. With neither peril did the new ministry deal firmly. Though they had utilized coercion to turn out Peel, they soon found that without it they dare not face the coming winter in Ireland. They introduced an arms bill, but taunted with inconsistency, they dropped it, and Lord Bessborough was bidden to do his best with the ordinary law. It was clear to demonstration that the remedies hitherto devised for a calamity, unexampled in extent and severity, had completely failed. Lord John therefore determined in the first place on a gradual discontinuance of the labour rate. It was costing the government one million sterling a month, and to the Irish people was doing at least as much harm as good. On August 15th, the act expired, and this disastrous experiment was at an end. But the Irish executive were still responsible for feeding a nation. The Prime Minister believed that no permanent remedy could be devised which did not embrace an amendment of the poor law, a radical reform of the land system, and a large scheme of emigration. But such a legislative program would occupy the Imperial Parliament for years, and meanwhile the Irish peasants had day by day to be saved, if possible, from death by actual starvation. Russell refused, and very properly, to relax any of the rules against employment of public labor on the improvement of private estates, but he agreed to advance money to improving landlords on easy terms. He instructed the Lord Lieutenant to acquire for the government waste lands and to sell or let them when reclaimed in plots of moderate size. He distributed a vast quantity of seed and attempted to develop the fisheries in the West by the introduction of expert fish curers from Scotland to give technical instruction to the natives, and by providing them with salt and tackle at cheap rates. Finally, he determined to substitute relief by food for relief by labor. So severe and general was destitution that by June of 1847, no less than 3,020,712 persons were daily supported on government rations. By the autumn of 1847, however, the worst was over. After the winter of 1847-1848, the famine was at an end. To succor a starving nation was no light task, but the famine itself was the least complex of the problems which arose from the failure of the potato. To discuss exhaustively the results of the famine would be to compress into a chapter the history of Ireland during the last half-century. 
but some of the immediate results may be summarized the mere money cost of the calamity was appalling in one year eighteen forty six eighteen forty seven the loss on the oat crop and the potato crop was estimated at sixteen million pounds the irish board of works spent some eleven million pounds on relief there was a large augmentation of local rates in addition of course to the vast sums lavishly poured out by the imperial government by societies and by individuals to the landlords the famine was disastrous one third of them were totally ruined with nothing before them but the cold comfort of the encumbered estates court the establishment of this court was another almost inevitable result of the famine erected by a statute passed in eighteen forty nine it commenced its sittings on october twenty fifth of the same year the act gave to the vendor a simple short inexpensive mode of selling and transferring land and to the purchaser the advantage of a parliamentary title impeachable by no jurisdiction and valid in the face of the whole world immediate advantage was taken of the new machinery afforded by the act between october eighteen forty nine and august eighteen fifty seven no less than seven thousand four hundred and eighty nine new proprietors of whom seven thousand one hundred and eighty were irishmen obtained a stake in the country by this means while the total sum realized by these sales amounted to twenty million four hundred and seventy five thousand nine hundred and fifty six pounds the act was therefore far from inoperative but its results grievously disappointed expectations the old proprietors were swept away the new purchasers bought for profit no sentiment intervened to soften the relations between the new men and their tenants rents were raised defaulters were evicted and the last state of the peasant was in many cases worse than the first the final result of the measure was therefore to accentuate a difficulty it was intended to mitigate and to render still more imperative a legalization of customary rights closely connected with this land legislation was the amendment of the irish poor law under the pressure of the famine the administration of relief entirely broke down and in eighteen forty seven the law itself was amended outdoor relief was legalized the boards of guardians were required to appoint medical and relieving officers owners were made liable to rates and the government took powers to dissolve boards of guardians for the non-performance or neglect of duties on the other hand severe penalties were enacted against mendicants and vagrants and it was provided as a further test of destitution that no occupier of more than a quarter of an acre of land should be entitled to relief the poor law amendment act had one curious result it gave an additional stimulus to emigration between eighteen forty six and eighteen fifty one over a million people left the shores of ireland and nearly a million died at home in eighteen forty one the population stood at eight million one hundred and seventy five thousand one hundred and twenty four by eighteen fifty one it had fallen to six million five hundred and fifty two thousand three hundred and eighty five in the half century between eighteen thirty one and eighteen eighty one the irish population decreased by thirty two per cent while that of england and wales increased by eighty seven per cent so much for the economic results of the great visitation it remains to examine the political and social sequelae the increase in the amount of serious crime was appalling the homicides increased from one hundred and seventy in eighteen forty six to two hundred and twelve in eighteen forty seven firing at the person from one hundred and fifty nine in the former year to two hundred and sixty four in the latter and most significant of all as proving the political character of the agitation thefts of arms increased from six hundred and eleven in eighteen forty six to one thousand and fifty three in eighteen forty seven 
murder followed murder with hideous regularity and the assassins with equal regularity escaped detection lord clarendon who had succeeded lord bessborough as lord lieutenant asked the cabinet in 1847 for further powers lord john held back though his diagnosis of the situation was acute as to the source of all this crime he writes to lord clarendon on november tenth it is plain that the multitude consider the landlords as enemies to be shot the priests denounce them as heretics to be cursed and the assassin having public opinion and what he considered as religion in his favour has no remorse by this time the parliament which was elected in eighteen forty one had run its course and on november eighteen forty seven the new parliament met lord john found himself at the head of three hundred and twenty five liberals the protectionists mustered two hundred and twenty six and the conservative free traders one hundred and five peel steadily supported the government who was thus emboldened to pass a stringent coercion act the lord lieutenant was authorized to proclaim any disturbed districts and in such districts to require licenses for the carrying of arms and to increase the police force at the cost of the locality russell insisted however that coercion should not stand alone hence the encumbered estates act which as we have seen became law in eighteen forty nine and a second bill to afford tenants compensation for improvements which was thrown out but though the roots of disorder might not have been touched the more distressing symptoms rapidly abated the assassin began to be detected juries began to convict the law exacted a semblance of respect and the terror which reigned among the innocent was transferred as a contemporary phrased it to the guilty but eighteen forty eight was at hand it would have been little short of miraculous if the year of revolution had passed without incident in ireland the trend of events had for some time been toward an armed insurrection ever since the fatal repeal year o'connell had been losing ground young ireland had been coming to the front but so far the leader had been lacking he was at last found in an irish aristocrat of gentle birth and english breeding smith o'brien was the son of an irish baronet a cadet of the earldom of tomond a descendant of brian boru educated at harrow and cambridge he had entered the house of commons in eighteen twenty eight as member for ennis and until eighteen thirty two gave a general support to the tory government but in eighteen forty three he joined the ranks of the repealers and in eighteen forty six he headed a formidable secession and took with him a crowd of visionary enthusiasts including such men as thomas francis mayer john mitchell and gavin duffy early in eighteen forty seven the irish confederation was inaugurated its object was repeal its methods constitutional but events were moving faster than smith o'brien in february eighteen forty eight the republic was again proclaimed in france and the tone fitzgerald farce was revived by mayor and o'brien lamartine gave the irish envoys a chilly welcome poet and idealist though he was he was also a statesman enough to question the wisdom of bartering the sympathy of england for an alliance with young ireland by this time however the movement in ireland had become sufficiently obtrusive to compel the english government to take action to put the old treason law into operation against young irishmen was to employ a sledgehammer to crush beetles early in eighteen forty eight therefore the treason felony act was passed and a large number of offences were removed from the category of treason into that of treason felony smith o'brien was arrested but escaped conviction through the disagreement of the jury mitchell by far the most daring and inventive of the confederate leaders was on may twenty seventh sentenced to fourteen years of transportation and deported to bermuda his removal proved to be a fatal blow to the revolutionary party though its immediate effect was to hurry his associates into action 
on july twenty first a war directory of five persons was appointed in dublin and a few days later o'brien formally raised the standard of insurrection the response was almost tragically disappointing a few half-armed half-starved peasants enrolled themselves under his banner and on the twenty ninth of july they attacked a small body of police who took up a position in a house near ballingery the fight that ensued is known to history as the battle of widow mccormick's cabbage garden no great damage was done except to the cabbages the peasants dispersed and within a week o'brien was arrested the executive meanwhile had not been idle half a dozen of the chief towns including dublin and cork with as many counties had been proclaimed the habeas corpus act had been suspended a vast quantity of arms had been seized and a proclamation had been issued offering five hundred pounds reward for the arrest of o'brien arrested on august fifth he was tried for high treason and found guilty and condemned to be hanged drawn and quartered despite his own protest the sentence was commuted and he was transported to australia mayor shared his fate and the irish forty eight was at an end sonorously tragic in its opening it had degenerated into farce and was eventually killed almost as much by ridicule as by coercion in august eighteen forty nine queen victoria accompanied by the prince consort and their elder children paid her first visit to ireland expensive ceremonial would under the circumstances have been an outrage upon decency the queen with characteristic consideration refused to allow it and visited cork dublin and belfast in her yacht the unaffected enthusiasm with which the royal party was received more than atoned for the absence of ornate preparations and profoundly touched the queen's heart the visit unhappily not repeated for half a century did something also to obliterate the painful and bitter memories of the last three years a year later russell proposed to abolish the viceroyalty but yielded somewhat weakly to the clamour which such a proposal inevitably creates he succeeded however in carrying a bill for a considerable extension of the irish franchise in ireland therefore the ministry was at last sailing into smoother waters apart from ireland political interests centred in lord palmerston's conduct of foreign affairs before proceeding however to that topic it may be well to say something of the progress of affairs at home in their financial policy russell and sir charles wood adhered steadfastly to the principle of gulburn and peel in eighteen forty six they abolished the preference hitherto given to the english colonies and produced an extra three hundred thousand pounds for the year's revenue but these results in the view of lord george bentinck were obtained at a cost of imperial ruin so great as to be intolerable in producing their budget for eighteen forty seven the government was confronted by a strangely paradoxical situation a year of exceptional distress and dislocation had yielded an overflowing revenue the harvest had failed prices were high thousands of people had to be kept alive by public and private bounty yet the exchequer was full the cost of the famine for the current year was estimated at eight million pounds which would justifiably raised by a loan obtained at three pounds seven shillings six pence per cent the general election which took place in the late summer of eighteen forty seven had little effect upon the balance of parties but it had a significant bearing upon the fiscal question the liberals were in a majority of ninety nine over the protectionists but the balance was held by one hundred and five peelites macaulay lost his seat at edinburgh owing to his vote on the maynooth bill but the tariff reformers were for the most part triumphantly returned villers and bright in lancashire cobden for the west riding the year eighteen forty seven was however less remarkable for a general election than for a commercial crisis of unusual severity 
the cyclical fluctuation of trade is now a phenomenon of common observation no one expects a boom to be prolonged indefinitely the lean years follow upon the fat with unfailing regularity in eighteen forty seven the phenomenon was relatively unfamiliar and consequently more alarming apart from that the crisis was exceptionally acute a period of speculation and overtrading was as usual followed by stringency in the money market and ultimately by collapse of credit prices fluctuated widely and the famine intensified the prevailing distress but the immediate cause of the crisis was the railway mania in the three years eighteen forty four to eighteen forty six parliament sanctioned a capital expenditure of one hundred and eighty five million pounds while the railway companies were in november eighteen forty five anxious to raise no less than seven hundred million pounds of new capital no country in the world could have stood the strain the smash came in the autumn of eighteen forty seven no fewer than two hundred and twenty great houses failed and the total losses were estimated at thirty million pounds consoles having averaged ninety-five and three-quarter in eighteen forty six fell to seventy-eight the discount rate rose nominally to eight per cent but even at that rate few could get accommodation on twenty fifth october however the government authorized the bank of england to infringe the terms of their charter and to issue notes without the legal reserve in specie so successful was this action that confidence was quickly restored and no indemnity was actually required End of section nineteen section twenty of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter ten lord john russell's first administration eighteen forty six to eighteen fifty two the irish famine and its consequences part two the panic of eighteen forty eight proceeded from another quarter our relations with france were uneasy and the country believed itself to be unprepared to resist invasion and this combined with the tiresome war in south africa necessitated increased expenditure on armaments on february eighteenth the prime minister himself introduced the budget and proposed to raise the income tax from seven pence to one shilling offering in return the abolition of the duty on copper ore within a fortnight however the outbreak of the february revolution in paris removed all causes for immediate alarm and on february twenty eighth the chancellor of the exchequer proposed to drop the additional five pence a third edition of the budget was produced at the end of june and a fourth on august twenty fifth these infirmities of purpose did not add to the credit of the government but thanks to improving trade they muddled through the year without embarrassment to the exchequer fortune favoured them in another direction the year eighteen forty eight was a period of anxiety not only in ireland but in every quarter of continental europe the fire lighted in paris spread with great rapidity italy hungary and bohemia blazed simultaneously into revolution in rome and venice republics were proclaimed and thrones tottered in vienna and many of the lesser german courts in england the chartists quiescence since the collapse of the physical force movement in eighteen thirty nine were roused to renewed activity by fergus o'connor they prepared a gargantuan petition embodying the six points and organized a monster demonstration to be held in london on april tenth on april sixth the home secretary prohibited the procession to palace yard the duke of wellington was called in to advise the cabinet on april eighth one hundred and seventy thousand special constables were sworn in and the duke made adequate but unostentatious preparations 
to prevent the demonstrators from crossing Westminster Bridge. The wise and kindly precautions of the government and the Duke saved the situation. The Chartists drew back. The monster petition was forwarded to the Palace of Westminster in a cab. It was found on examination to contain less than half of the estimated number of signatures, and many of these were palpably fictitious. The tables were dissolved in laughter, and Chartism ceased to trouble the land. Although its immediate program was exclusively political, the driving force behind it was economic. For the economic problem, Peel had found a solvent, and the banner of Chartism was never again unfolded. Nevertheless, almost the whole of the political program has now been carried out. One valuable addition to the statute book may be conveniently mentioned here. In 1847, Lord Ashley and Mr. Fielden, a Lancashire cotton spinner and member for Oldham, carried a bill to limit the hours of labor for women and children in textile factories to ten hours. It was, according to one writer, a victory for the people of England over official England. According to another, it represented the revenge of the landlords upon the manufacturers for reform and free trade. There is an element of truth in both statements, though neither contains the whole truth. The apostles of laissez-faire were naturally opposed to state interference with industry. Protectionists and philanthropists welcomed it. The main credit of the achievement was Lord Ashley's, though in the House of Lords the bishops gave him loyal support. The Manchester School, worsted in 1847, had their revenge in 1849 and 1850, the bottom had already been knocked out of the navigation laws by the legislation of the Tory government of 1823. They were finally repealed by the Whigs in 1849. Canada was complaining that the abolition of the Corn Laws rendered their wheat growers powerless in face of American competition, and Graham roundly asserted that if the bill were rejected, Canada would secede. The bill was carried without difficulty in the Commons, but in the Lords only by a majority of ten, of whom eight were bishops. To insist that this measure confirmed the supremacy of Great Britain in the carrying trade is not to impugn the wisdom of those by whom the navigation laws were originally enacted. The infant industry had long since outgrown the need of swaddling clothes. A further measure in harmony with the prevailing tenets of the Manchester School was enacted in 1850. New South Wales and other Australian colonies aspired to the dignity of responsible government attained ten years earlier by Canada. The Act of 1850 conferred upon them general powers enabling them virtually to settle their own form of government. Acting on this permission, New Zealand and New South Wales, together with the daughter colonies of the latter, Victoria, Tasmania, South Australia, and Queensland, all framed responsible constitutions between 1854 and 1859. Western Australia followed suit in 1890. Less intrinsically important than these measures, but more immediately striking to the imagination, was the opening of the Great Exhibition of 1851. The initiation and successful completion of this enterprise was mainly due to the Prince Consort, who was a wholehearted disciple of the Manchester School. Of the principles of that school, the Exhibition of 1851 was the apotheosis. It was intended not only to promote industry and commerce, but to inaugurate an era of international peace. O ye, the wise who think, the wise who reign, from growing commerce loose her latest chain, and let the fair white-winged peacemaker fly to happy havens under all the sky, and mix the seasons and the golden hours till each man find his own in all men's good, and all men work in noble brotherhood breaking their mailed fleets and armed towers, and ruling by obeying nature's powers, and gathering all the fruits of earth, and crowned with all her flowers. Footnote. 
tennyson ode sung at the opening of the international exhibition end footnote it is pathetic to think how soon the dream faded gratifying as was the success of the exhibition to the queen and the prince consort hopeful as it seemed for the future of european peace it did little to arrest the decay of the russell ministry conscious of increasing debility russell attempted in january eighteen forty nine to induce sir james graham to fill the vacancy at the admiralty caused by the sudden death of lord auckland graham had already in eighteen forty seven declined the governor-generalship of india from lord john as he had previously declined it in eighteen thirty five from peel he now declined a peerage and the admiralty chiefly on three grounds he mistrusted palmerston's foreign policy he did not like coercion in ireland and he was dissatisfied with the progress of retrenchment under the russell ministry even more serious for the government than the refusal of graham was the death of peel july second eighteen fifty to say that peel was their strongest supporter in the house of commons is to understate the case without peel's favour they could not have survived for a week apart from the embarrassment caused to the ministry and its chief by the independence of palmerston at the foreign office there were not lacking other elements of weakness they suffered defeat in the lords on their parliamentary oaths bill in eighteen forty nine in finance they gave the impression of not knowing their own mind an impression strengthened by their conduct of the budget of eighteen fifty on the subject of parliamentary reform the prime minister's own wishes were frustrated by the cabinet above all there was unrest in the churches in ecclesiastical administration russell was a typical whig of the eighteenth century himself a man of deep and unaffected piety his ecclesiastical bias was toward liberal evangelicanism but he was primarily an erastian mr gorham's successful appeal to the privy council eighteen fifty gave him therefore genuine pleasure on every ground dr philpotts bishop of exeter had refused to institute mr gorham to a benefice in that diocese on account of his erroneous views on baptismal regeneration the court of arches supported the bishop the privy council as ultimate court of appeal in ecclesiastical causes declared in favour of gorham by the tractarians the judgment was bitterly resented and for two reasons they questioned the right of a secular court to pronounce judgment on a question of doctrine and they disliked the particular doctrine held by mr gorham the heat engendered by this judgment has not yet entirely evaporated but it would not be easy to set up a tribunal at once more efficient and more impartial the judicial committee does not presume to decide whether a particular doctrine is false or true it is merely invested with authority to declare whether such a doctrine is consistent with the formularies of the established church the excitement aroused by the gorham controversy was however partial and insignificant compared with the universal ferment into which england was thrown by an act of papal aggression on september thirtieth eighteen fifty pope pius the ninth now restored to the vatican by republican france issued a bull dividing england into twelve territorial dioceses hitherto the roman bishops had been in partibus but father wiseman was now created a cardinal and archbishop of westminster and the other roman bishops assumed territorial titles the thing itself in truth is little or nothing and does not justify the irritation what has goaded the nation is the manner insolent and ostentatious in which it has been done thus palmerston wrote to his brother and his words described with absolute precision the situation to lord john the action of the papacy seemed to be insolent and insidious and the prime minister unquestionably represented in this matter the opinions of the great mass of his countrymen 
but there was ambiguity in his assertion that the nation looked with contempt on the mummeries of superstition and to describe the tractarians as unworthy sons of the church of england was gratuitously offensive the alienation of the high churchmen further weakened the ministry but they were strong enough in eighteen fifty one to pass the ecclesiastical titles bill which declared the papal bull null and void and imposed heavy penalties on all who attempted to give effect to it the tactlessness of pius the ninth cardinal antonelli and cardinal wiseman was paralleled only by the exaggerated alarm it excited in england russell's act valuable as a vent to outraged feelings remained a dead letter until it was quietly repealed in eighteen seventy one meanwhile the prime minister had attempted to escape from a situation of deepening embarrassment in eighteen fifty disraeli who on the death of lord george bentinck in eighteen forty eight had become leader of the conservative party in the house of commons failed to carry a motion deploring the depression of agriculture only by twenty-one votes in eighteen fifty one the majority against him fell to fourteen and in the same session mr locke king carried against the government by one hundred to fifty-two a motion for the extension of the county franchise thereupon lord john tendered his resignation to the queen february twenty first lord stanley refused to form a cabinet until russell had tried to effect a coalition with the peelites by the queen's wish lord john met lord aberdeen and sir james graham at buckingham palace but the latter declined to make themselves responsible for the ecclesiastical titles bill the negotiations consequently broke down and upon march third the russell cabinet resumed office the end however was not long postponed another overture was made to graham in september equally without success palmerston was dismissed from the foreign office in december being succeeded by lord granville and in february eighteen fifty two palmerston turned out his late colleagues on a militia bill relations between russell and palmerston had become increasingly strained but the latter administered his tit-for-tat with perfect good humour and bore his late chief no malice as prime minister lord john was not a complete success he was conscientious almost to a fault in the discharge of his duties but keen as was his intellect his physical strength was unequal to the strain of coping with a colleague so masterful in temper so ebullient in spirits and so utterly regardless of official decorum as lord palmerston in essential policy the two were not far apart in method and in manners they were poles asunder from the first russell had encountered many difficulties and a greater and stronger man might well have failed to surmount them parties were in a state of solution discipline was relaxed in the house of commons and if russell retained office for six years it was due less to the cohesion of his supporters than to the lack of it among his opponents his most valuable asset was peel's loyalty to free trade and the steady support which that statesman gave to the only ministry which could maintain it peel's death was a blow to the government from which ultimate recovery was hopeless and it was probably a relief to all concerned not least to the prime minister that its declining years were not unduly prolonged End of section twenty Section 21 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 Great Britain and Continental Politics, 1846 to 1852. Lord Palmerston and Queen Victoria. Part 1 during the administration of sir robert peel foreign affairs were in the background 
lord aberdeen and guizot were on terms of exceptional cordiality and their personal friendship did much to maintain a good understanding between great britain and france so long as the two great western powers were friendly international peace in europe was not likely in the middle years of the century to be seriously endangered with the return of lord palmerston to the foreign office all this was speedily changed foreign affairs immediately became of primary importance it is true that the minister himself repudiated bellicose intentions and not less true that he was able in eighteen fifty one to boast that though events have happened in europe of the most remarkable kind and attended with great commotions of public feeling and great agitation in the social and political system of the continent although events have happened which have brought the interests of england into opposition to the interests of other great and powerful nations yet at least the fact is that peace has been preserved the claim was characteristic and not ill-founded nevertheless the advent of palmerston to power fluttered the dovecotes in more than one continental capital notably in paris for the tension which arose between the two countries the government of king louis philippe was however almost entirely responsible the question of providing the little queen isabella of spain with a husband had been for some time under discussion following the traditional policy of the bourbon louis philippe was anxious to strengthen his dynastic connection with spain england objected to the idea of a french prince becoming prince consort but after an interchange of visits with the french court in eighteen forty four and eighteen forty five queen victoria agreed to the engagement of the duc de montpensier younger son of the french king to maria louisa younger sister of the queen of spain it was however stipulated that the marriage should not take place until after the birth of an heir to the throne of spain the young queen was now eighteen forty five in her sixteenth year her mother the regent failing a french prince would have preferred a cobourg lord aberdeen promised guizot that such an alliance should receive no support from england but in eighteen forty six the queen regent offered the queen's hand to prince leopold of saxe coburg a nephew of the king of the belgians and a brother of the king of portugal palmerston's mention of prince leopold's possible candidature in a foreign office dispatch gave louis philippe a pretext for repudiating his promise and on october tenth eighteen forty six the marriage of queen isabella to her cousin don francisco duke of cadiz and of her sister to montpensier was simultaneously celebrated at madrid the spanish prince was a man notoriously unfit for marriage and the news of the shameful proceeding caused the liveliest indignation in england not least at court for the queen resented it as a personal breach of faith and deplored it as a wanton destruction of the entente guizot's conduct she wrote is beyond all belief shameful and so shabbily dishonest my feelings were and are deeply wounded the spanish marriage question was however of transitory importance always unsavoury and perhaps exaggerated at the moment it lost whatever significance it ever possessed after the fall of the orleanist dynasty in france the politics of the west quickly reacted on the east the rupture of the anglo-french entente gave austria the opportunity with the cordial assent of her eastern neighbours of extinguishing the independence of Krakow, the last remnant of free Poland. Against this annexation, Lord Palmerston protested in vain. In regard to Portugal, however, the Western powers were still able to act in accord. Matters had not settled down in that unhappy country. In May of 1846, the Miguelists, 
again raised an insurrection and only by the aid of an english fleet acting in conjunction with the fleets of france and spain was the authority of queen maria and the ascendancy of the constitutional party restored eighteen forty seven but for palmerston's prompt intervention queen maria would have owed her restoration to spain and a severe check would have been concurrently administered to liberal principles and to english commerce a project launched about this time for the eventual fusion of portugal and spain was sternly resisted by the english minister equally effective was his action in reference to the swiss sonderbund between eighteen thirty and eighteen forty eight switzerland was in a condition of perpetual unrest and there seemed little probability that the confederation would hold together in eighteen thirty two the union was threatened by the progressive cantons who formed the Siebener concordat to secure the sanctity of their reformed constitutions in eighteen forty three the seven roman catholic and more conservative cantons retaliated with the sonderbund the sonderbund stood for religious education the retention of the jesuits the maintenance of the monasteries and the sanctity of the federal pact of eighteen fifteen the conservative cantons could count on the strong support of metternich with whose views russia prussia and sardinia were in full accord guizot and louis philippe inclined in the same direction english opinion on the contrary was strongly influenced by grota's letters to the spectator in favour of the progressive cantons palmerston saw his opportunity of paying off louis philippe for the spanish trick and metternich for the annexation of cracow his anxiety was twofold to prevent the intervention of the reactionary courts in switzerland and to secure the final expulsion of the jesuits he played his game with consummate skill he kept the ring for the protestant cantons warding off the interference of the powers and he had the satisfaction of seeing the forces of unionism and progress completely triumphant november eighteen forty seven the sonderbund was dissolved the federal union was consolidated and switzerland was finally delivered from the dangers of foreign influence the sonderbund episode served to intensify the mistrust felt by palmerston for the continental courts particularly that of austria the moment was fast approaching when the habsburg dominions were to pass through the revolutionary furnace on every side they were vulnerable in hungary bohemia above all perhaps in italy palmerston gauged to a nicety the situation in italy and in eighteen forty seven he dispatched lord minto on a special mission to warn the italian sovereigns of the coming cataclysm and to advise them to avert revolution by timely reforms you are instructed to say he wrote to the english representatives at the italian courts that the direction of the progress of reform and improvement is still in the hands of the sovereign but that it is now too late for him to attempt to obstruct reasonable progress january eighteen forty eight yield to-day that which is reasonably asked and resist to-morrow that which you will be borne out in resisting but do not let us put ourselves in the wrong to-day merely for fear that we may find ourselves in the right to-morrow nor must reform be obstructed should the sovereigns decide to initiate it by outside interference in making this claim on their behalf palmerston showed himself the true disciple of castlereagh and canning the italian sovereigns were not wholly inattentive to his advice in january king ferdinand granted a constitution to the two sicilies the grand duke of tuscany followed suit in february and early in march constitutions were established in piedmont and in rome but news had by this time reached italy which caused all thought of mere constitutional reform to be flung aside the floodgates of revolution burst open in paris louis philippe 
pusillanimously abdicated on February 24th, and France proclaimed the Second Republic. In March, the waters reached Vienna. Revolutions broke out in Austria, Hungary, Bohemia, and many parts of Germany. Metternich himself was driven into exile. The news aroused the greatest enthusiasm among Italian liberals. Before the end of March, the Austrians were compelled to evacuate Milan. Venice re-established the Republic under Daniel Manin. Metternich's puppets fled from their thrones in Modena. Charles Albert, King of Sardinia, placed himself at the head of the national movement. The Grand Duke of Tuscany joined him. Even Ferdinand of Naples was obliged to simulate adherence to the movement. Lombardy, Venice, Parma, Piacenza, Modena declared by plebiscite for fusion with Sardinia. The union of North Italy under the hegemony of Sardinia seemed, in the twinkling of an eye, to have been achieved. The Italian Risorgimento had no more cordial friend than England. Palmerston favoured from the first the formation of an Italian federation, one unit of which would be a large North Italian kingdom, stretching from the Alps to the Adriatic, under the House of Savoy. As for the Habsburg Empire, he believed that it would be strengthened rather than weakened by the surrender of the Italian provinces. I cannot regret, he wrote to the King of the Belgians, the expulsion of the Austrians from Italy. Her rule was hateful to the Italians and has long been maintained only by an expenditure of money and an exertion of military effort which left Austria less able to maintain her interests elsewhere. Italy was to her the heel of Achilles and not the shield of Ajax. The Alps are her natural barrier and her best defense. To Austrian rule elsewhere he was no enemy. North of the Alps, we wish her all the prosperity and success in the world. The Prime Minister shared the views of the Foreign Secretary, though he expressed them with more reserve. To the court, however, they were anathema. On July 1st, 1848, the Queen wrote to Palmerston, She cannot conceal from him that she is ashamed of the policy which we are pursuing in this Italian controversy. For one thing, Queen and ministers were alike obviously unprepared. The remarkable recovery of the Habsburg power in Italy. On March 23, 1849, Charles Albert's last army was crushed by Radetzky at Novara. In August, Venice surrendered. The vassal princes were once more restored in central Italy. The Roman Republic had fallen before the assault of France in July. Pius IX was restored to the Vatican. King Ferdinand, or Bomba, as his subjects called him, was once more supreme in the two Sicilies. On every side the revolutionary movement collapsed, and for another decade the triumph of Austrian absolutism in Italy was assured. Despite his strong sympathy for the Italian cause, and indeed for that of oppressed nationalities wherever they were to be found, Palmerston preserved the formal neutrality of England with tolerable success. Every post, he writes, sends me a lamenting minister throwing himself and his country upon England for help, which I am obliged to tell him we cannot afford him. Nevertheless, the Woolwich arsenal was permitted to supply the Sicilian insurgents indirectly with arms, and Palmerston allowed himself the luxury of pouring out his soul to a somewhat unsympathetic ambassador at Vienna. The Austrians, he wrote to Ponsonby, September 9th, 1849, are really the greatest brutes that ever called themselves by the undeserved name of civilized men. Their atrocities in Galicia, in Italy, in Hungary, in Transylvania, are only to be equaled by the proceedings of the Negro race in Africa and Haiti. I do hope that you will maintain the honor and dignity of England by expressing openly and decidedly the disgust which such proceedings excite in the public mind in this country. 
small wonder that such vehemence excited the alarm of palmerston's royal mistress with the people however his popularity steadily increased the minister was not content with words he encouraged the sultan to refuse to surrender koshut and other hungarian refugees who had escaped into turkey and when the latter was threatened with war by austria and russia he ordered the british fleet up to the dardanelles the french republic acted in concert with great britain but with or without allies palmerston was resolved to support turkey let who will be against her in this matter he was prepared even for war though he did not anticipate it the dispatch of the fleet was for the sultan like holding a bottle of salts to the nose of a lady who has been frightened the bold policy was successful but the pace set by palmerston was becoming too hot for his colleagues neither to their qualms however nor to those of the queen did he pay much heed he regarded the foreign office as his peculium and all intruders were politely warned off the prime minister though sympathetic in the main toward his colleague's policy found it impossible to defend his methods the queen detested the end no less than the means by palmerston himself her remonstrances were ignored lord john though no courtier could not and did not treat them so lightly he felt indeed and told palmerston that the queen's uneasiness was not always groundless and by the spring of eighteen fifty he had made up his mind to remove his impetuous lieutenant from the foreign office his intention however was frustrated partly by the attack made upon the foreign policy of the government by the opposition leaders and still more by palmerston's superb vindication of it in the house of commons a vindication which put him on a pedestal of popularity to that popularity nothing contributed more powerfully than palmerston's enforcement of the claims of two british subjects against the corrupt and dilatory government of greece at the hands of that government mr finlay the eminent historian and don pacifico a portuguese jew born in gibraltar had suffered unquestionable wrong that pacifico's own record was none the best mattered nothing to the foreign secretary equally with mr finlay he was a british subject his repeated and just demands for redress had been ignored at athens lord palmerston's own efforts were similarly vain and he determined therefore to instruct the british admiral to take athens on his way back from the dardanelles russia resented the pressure thus put upon king otto the enfant gâté de l'absolutisme the french president sulked was offended by the refusal of his offer of mediation and withdrew his ambassador drouin de louis from london but palmerston went on his way unheeding and quickly achieved the desired end not even in england were his methods universally approved in the house of lords lord stanley moved that while the house fully recognizes the right and duty of the government to secure to her majesty's subjects residing in foreign states the full protection of the laws of those states it regrets to find that various claims against the greek government doubtful in point of justice or exaggerated in amount have been enforced by coercive measures directed against the commerce and people of greece and calculated to endanger the continuance of our friendly relations with other powers supported by lord aberdeen and lord brougham the motion was carried by a majority of thirty-seven in the commons on the contrary a vote of confidence was carried after four nights debate by a majority of forty-six that result was primarily due to lord palmerston's own speech holding the attention of the house for no less than four hours the minister offered an elaborate vindication of his whole work at the foreign office in turn he passed in review his action in regard to greece portugal spain switzerland and italy defended the principles which could be traced throughout it and challenged a verdict on the policy as a whole one at least of his points was incontrovertible while we have seen thrones shaken shattered levelled institutions overthrown and destroyed while in almost every country of europe 
the conflict of civil war has deluged the land with blood this country has presented a spectacle honourable to the people of england and worthy of the admiration of mankind nor could his concluding question fail of its effect whether as the roman in the days of old held himself free from indignity when he could say qui vis romanus sum so also a british subject in whatever land he may be shall feel confident that the watchful eye and the strong arm of england will protect him against injustice and wrong peel in the last speech he ever delivered declared that palmerston's speech has made us all proud of him lord john felicitously described him as minister of england he himself confessed to his brother that he had become the most popular man that for a very long course of time had held the foreign office end of section twenty one section twenty two of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven great britain and continental politics eighteen forty six to eighteen fifty two lord palmerston and queen victoria part two lord palmerston's triumph though complete was short-lived rhetoric might sway the house of commons it had no effect whatever on the judgment of the queen she resented the minister's treatment of the crown she deplored his diplomatic methods and she profoundly mistrusted his aims in particular she complained and with reason that the minister gave her no time to master the contents of dispatches which she was called upon to approve palmerston on his side treated the queen much as an old family solicitor is apt to treat a young lady client her perusal and approval were to be taken for granted the queen's conception of her plain duty was diametrically opposed to this she repeatedly complained not only to the foreign secretary but to the prime minister neither to her remonstrances nor to his chiefs did palmerston pay the least attention the queen urged his removal from the foreign office and russell acquiesced but the issue of the debate on june twenty ninth warned him of the futility of attempting it at the moment on july twenty eighth the queen again complained that there is no question of delicacy and danger which lord palmerston will not arbitrarily and without reference to his colleagues or sovereign engage this country ultimately on august twelfth the queen drafted a formal memorandum explaining what it is she expects from her foreign secretary she requires number one that he will distinctly state what he proposes in a given case in order that the queen may know as distinctly to what she has given her royal sanction number two having once given her sanction to a measure that it be not arbitrarily altered or modified by the minister such an act she must consider as failing in sincerity toward the crown and justly to be visited by the exercise of her constitutional right of dismissing that minister she expects to be kept informed of what passes between him and the foreign ministers before important decisions are taken based upon that intercourse to receive the foreign dispatches in good time and to have the drafts for her approval sent to her in sufficient time to make herself acquainted with their contents before they must be sent off lord palmerston professed penitence promised amendment and went on precisely as before in the autumn general Heinau, an austrian soldier who had earned a reputation for exceptional cruelty in hungary was mobbed and hooted in london by the draymen when he was visiting the brewery of messrs barclay and perkins palmerston had to apologize to the austrian ambassador baron kohler but could not refrain from an expression of his opinion that heinau's visit was a wanton insult to the people of this country the queen was seriously annoyed and told the minister that she could 
as little approve of the introduction of lynch law in this country as of the violent vituperations with which lord palmerston accuses and condemns public men in other countries without having the means of obtaining correct information or of sifting evidence the rebuke was a stinging one but no candid person can affirm that it was unmerited as spokesman of great britain among the nations palmerston had great merits and under a strong prime minister they might have been less obviously balanced by defects as it was the task of correction fell too often to the crown and the crown cannot permit repeated warnings to be disregarded without loss of dignity it was unfortunate that on the merits of the disputes between himself and the court the foreign secretary was more often right than wrong in regard to italy as in regard to schleswig-holstein and other questions the queen's views were indubitably biased by personal and dynastic considerations of these palmerston was not unnaturally intolerant but no degree of certainty as to the unassailable correctness of his own attitude can justify palmerston's disrespectful treatment of the crown some part of his irritation was doubtless due to the fact that there was a prince consort behind the throne and behind the prince a baron stockmar it is true also that the queen had not yet accumulated the experience which proved so valuable to her ministers in the later years of her reign but her grasp of european politics was already firm and apart from this she had certain constitutional rights in regard to the conduct of foreign affairs which no minister was at liberty to ignore nor was palmerston more complacent toward his colleagues and his chief than toward the sovereign throughout eighteen fifty and eighteen fifty one there was increasing friction between the prime minister and the foreign secretary it came to a head in october eighteen fifty one when kosciut the leader of the hungarian revolution landed in england it was announced that he was to be received by lord palmerston lord john insisted that the proposed interview would be improper and unnecessary and in plain terms interdicted it palmerston hotly retorted i do not choose to be dictated to as to whom i may or may not receive in my own house the cabinet supported the premier and palmerston gave way but a few weeks later he received a radical deputation which presented him with an address in which the emperors of austria and russia were referred to as odious and detestable assassins not unnaturally the queen was intensely annoyed but the premier though he could not justify his colleague still hesitated to dismiss him at last however even lord john's forbearance was exhausted or perhaps his timidity was overcome news reached london on december third eighteen fifty one of the military coup d'etat by which prince louis napoleon virtually overthrew the second republic footnote the formal overthrow was a year later december eighteen fifty two and footnote dissolving the chambers by armed force and crushing their supporters at the barricades with ruthless severity the queen learning of it on the fourth enjoined the strictest neutrality the prime minister concurred and instructions in this sense were sent by the foreign office to lord normanby footnote our ambassador in paris and footnote the latter learned however from the french foreign minister that palmerston had already expressed approval of the coup d'etat to count walewski footnote french ambassador in london he was an illegitimate son of napoleon i and a great confidant of his nephew and footnote an approval which naturally rendered his own position difficult he embodied the facts in a dispatch which ultimately came before the queen and the prime minister the latter entirely associated himself with the queen's displeasure dismissed palmerston from the foreign office and with the queen's cordial approval appointed in his place lord granville a curiously incongruous offer of the viceroyalty of ireland was caustically declined by palmerston 
the matter has been endlessly discussed but the facts are no longer in dispute it is clear that palmerston cordially approved the coup d'etat partly on the principle of self-defence partly on the ground that the existing constitution of france was unworkable it is clear also that while instructing normanby to maintain a neutral attitude in paris he allowed the french government to know his own opinion without reserve that normanby had grave cause for complaint against the foreign minister is certain that palmerston had cause for complaint against normanby is also probable on april sixteenth eighteen fifty louis napoleon said to lord malmesbury a visitor in paris your ambassador lord normanby is intriguing against me although his chief lord palmerston and some of your cabinet ministry are in my favour i believe lord normanby carries on a private correspondence with prince albert to my detriment that some of his colleagues including the prime minister shared his opinions and were partners in his indiscretion was publicly affirmed by palmerston and not denied by them but it is also true that in such a matter a peculiar responsibility attaches to the foreign secretary and it can hardly be denied that the queen had a fair pretext for insisting on his dismissal her own delight at the issue was unbounded i have the greatest pleasure she wrote to king leopold in announcing to you a piece of news which i know will give you as much satisfaction and relief as it does to us and will do to the whole world lord palmerston is no longer foreign secretary the queen's pleasure was shared at many courts particularly at vienna schwarzenberg gave a ball and an english attache wrote these arrogant fools here actually think that they have overthrown lord palmerston german opinion was not unfairly reflected in the doggerel lines hat der teufel einem sohn so ist er sicher palmerston the whole matter gave rise to formal explanations in the house of commons the french coup d'etat was not popular in england military plots are rightly disliked in a constitutional country the revelation of the queen's memorandum gave the prime minister a temporary perhaps an unfair advantage palmerston with some chivalry declined a retort and his reply was consequently ineffective and ill-received but as already recorded russell's triumph was brief for about two months he was master on his own quarter-deck but in the first breeze the ship itself foundered the coup d'etat induced a great deal of uneasiness in england a military monarchy led by unscrupulous men had replaced the weak republic the national defences were notoriously defective and russell therefore on february sixteenth proposed a scheme for the reorganization of the militia palmerston carried an amendment to the bill the ministry was left in a minority and treating the vote as one of no confidence resigned on february twentieth the queen called upon lord derby to form a government his party was in a clear minority in the house of commons it had no assured majority in the lords and its leaders after twenty years of whig and peelite administration were entirely lacking in official experience it was natural therefore that lord derby should look for help to the man who had turned out the late government palmerston however would not join him on account of protection and derby therefore had to rely exclusively upon inexperienced conservatives lord malmesbury succeeded lord granville at the foreign office sir john packington became colonial secretary mr walpole went to the home office the duke of northumberland took the admiralty and lord st leonard's the woolsack lord lonsdale who became lord president of the council and mr harry's who was president of the board of control were with their chief the only ministers who had ever held cabinet office before but of the new appointments incomparably the most interesting was that of disraeli who became chancellor of the exchequer and leader of the house of commons well might sir james graham give his grave head a portentous shake 
when he spoke of the novel precedent of a whole cargo of the rank and file being carried down to windsor to be made members of the privy council before they could receive the seals of office all kinds of jokes wrote lord malmesbury were made in respect of our being such novices in office lord derby himself referred to his team of young horses not one had ever been in harness before and they went beautifully not one kicked among them the new government was clearly a makeshift an appeal to the country could not be long delayed and until the constituencies had declared themselves it was agreed that the policy of the government fiscal and otherwise should be conceived as far as possible on non-controversial lines supported by palmerston they passed with ease to the chagrin of russell an act for the reorganization of the militia the scheme differed from the rejected scheme put forward by russell in two respects the new force was to be national instead of local and it was to be recruited by voluntary enlistment the compulsory ballot being reserved as a last resort disraeli's first essay as chancellor of the exchequer was eagerly awaited his budget however was framed necessarily on conventional lines he renewed the income tax for twelve months but for reasons stated above made no attempt to revive protectionist principles disraeli's own statement won the unstinted applause of the free traders who accepted it as a triumphant vindication of the policy pursued during the last ten years the parliament elected in eighteen forty seven was dissolved on july second eighteen fifty two but the general election made little change in the balance of parties in the new parliament the whigs and radicals numbered three hundred and nineteen the tories between two hundred and ninety and three hundred and the peelites forty to fifty parliament met on november fourth but the mind of the nation was set not on the vicissitudes of parties nor on political conflicts but on doing the last honours with hearts unisoned by the sense of national sorrow to one who was always above the common party turmoil on november eighteenth the iron duke who had died on september fourteenth was laid to rest in st paul's cathedral the sovereign and her people mourned in common for one who had served devotedly both queen and country truly was the great duke buried with an empire's lamentation to the noise of the mourning of a mighty nation no man wrote lord palmerston ever lived or died in the possession of a more unanimous love respect and esteem greville who was no respecter of persons noted the deference which all men paid to one who occupied a place unique among his countrymen this tribute was due not only to the conqueror of napoleon but to one who in council was recognized despite obvious limitations as having a single eye to his sovereign's and his country's interest our greatest yet with least pretense great in council and great in war foremost captain of his time rich in saving common sense and as the greatest only are in his simplicity sublime the elections had given no encouragement to protection and on november eleventh disraeli announced that the principle was to be decently interred for the militant free traders this was not enough they demanded from the derby ministry not merely abandonment but recantation on november twenty third villers proposed a motion to extort it but palmerston intervened and the house contented itself with a pious affirmation of the principle protection as disraeli said was not only dead but damned but the respite secured to the ministry by lord palmerston was of short duration on december third disraeli submitted his budget to the house of commons protection was dead but peel's most bitter assailant felt it incumbent upon him to do something for the mourners his scheme was highly ingenious and his exposition of it masterly he proposed to conciliate the general consumer by gradual remission of half the tea duty 
to help farmer and consumer alike by remitting half the malt tax, to assess income tax on one-third of the farmer's rental instead of one-half, to distinguish between earned and unearned income by extending the downward limit to one hundred pounds of the former and fifty pounds of the latter, he calculated that the readjustment of the income tax would make little difference in the yield, but the remissions of tea duty and malt tax were to be offset by an extension of the house tax to houses assessed at ten pounds a year, and the raising of the rate from nine pence to one shilling sixpence in the pound. On this last proposal he was defeated, and Lord Derby's spirited but short-lived enterprise came to an end. December 20th, 1852. End of Section 22